resin ready, but connectors refuse to cooperate. Burn bits at the block, is it a fluke or a failing trend? And uh, bumpy tops and beautiful bottoms, all this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 214. You know what, let's just get into it. Starting off with a problem with a connector from the resin printing subreddit here. They've got a part that they designed out in Rhino, but they did not do something specific, which is to add a little bit of tolerance. And look, you know, the Italian in you might say you need to add a little bit of space in there. And maybe that's for the Holy Ghost if you were raised Catholic, or maybe it's just so your parts can actually fit together. Traditionally in 3D printing, I don't really care how accurate your machine is, there is some level of inaccuracy to it and if you are not accounting for that in your design your parts simply will not go together now this being a resin print it is a pretty easy fix the first thing to do here you want to sand both the mating surfaces so that the flat surfaces that will meet together sand those both so they're nice and smooth we can see some cupping in the resin which means that the part should have been printed at more of an angle. With resin, you always want to reduce your cross-sectional area. Less cross-sectional area that you have, the less peel forces you have on the build plate and the vat, which makes your parts more dimensionally accurate. Yes, that means you will have to remove more support. Too bad you chose resin printing. This is the way that things go. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way you will still have to make sure that your connectors have a little bit of tolerance. And if they don't, you're gonna end up being a young grasshopper because it's time to be Mr. Miyagi. A little bit of wax on, wax off there with some sandpaper to sand those pins down. In this person's case, power sander. Now, remember, as long as the part is reasonably well cured, absolutely you will need a mask in some form of dust collection or far away from anything, you know, sensitive. Because of course, resin is toxic and you want to make sure you're not breathing those dust particles but sanding it down super simple resin tends to sand really really easily so you shouldn't have too many issues even if you don't own a power sander but at least when it comes to dealing with interactions of a mortise and tenon which is what we see here in this failure you want to have for resin parts 50 microns at the minimum 100 microns is pretty safe for FDM, you can dial it in, but traditionally a quarter of a millimeter is about all that you will need. And if you do run fast prints, you will often need to add more tolerance in. So go from a quarter of a millimeter to maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.35, or even 0.4 to get the pieces to fit properly. It is much easier to fill any extra area with like super glue and baking soda than it is to have to sand something down. That's my perspective. And Hey, if you're wondering what else my perspective is, my name is Grant, this is 3D Musketeers, and Printfix Rider, where we help you get your printers back to printing with purpose. And I'm actually in Shanghai right now, technically. We just got there, like, I don't know, about 12 hours ago, as of the release of this video, where we are going to be visiting FiberSeek, and potentially quite a few others, to see how they make their machines, and what makes continuous fiber 3D printing awesome. It is a Kickstarter. But we'll link to it in the description if you guys want to check it out. But no, there's going to be a ton of content that we're going to be filming there. And if we can, there will be live streams. But they'll be at odd hours because Shanghai in China is 12 hours ahead of where I am here in Florida. So timing on live streams will be odd. Keep an eye on the channel. If we are able to stream, you guys will see it. We will make announcements about it. Do not worry. And if you do obviously want to follow everything that we're doing a little bit closelier, you can do so by joining our Discord at the $10 tier and higher. But I'd love to know, what kind of tolerance do you guys add in your 3D prints? Let me know down in those comments. It kind of depends. Honestly, I kind of add tolerance like my mother taught me to use spices. You just kind of measure with your heart. And I swear if you think salt and pepper are the only two things that are required for seasoning, you're not welcome to my house. Anyways, moving on to a Anycubic Cobra S1 that was given the user the 10122 code, which not having an S1 Cobra, I couldn't tell you what the heck that actually is. But this Anycubic Cobra S1 got an error code. The machine shut itself off. They followed the wiki and noticed the hot end is stuck to the top of the print. So they took everything apart and they noticed some discoloration. Look at the top of that connector. It is 
burned. That is not what you want to see on something that is putting oh, the better part of 40 to 60 watts through what look like pretty small wires. I think this is a JST connector and I am relatively certain those connectors are not rated for the type of wattages that are going through the Honda. You can literally see the two for the thermistor, totally fine. Two for the hot in itself. Well, it looks like they've been in the sun a little bit too long. But what I can tell you is this is not okay. Now, it is a locking connector. So chances are it might have just wiggled loose. And the loose connector added a little bit of resistance, which created a hot zone, which caused it to heat up and effectively short out eventually, which is not technically outside of the scope of what any 3D printer could do but it is well outside of the scope of what a 3D printer should do. So we are going to be monitoring this one closely. This is apparently the second of these that have been reported. Uh, people in the comments of this were saying that there was another one that had happened previously. So we're not certain if this is just a fluke or if it is the sign of something larger. I will say, though, we've got some crimp wires here on the connector for the stepper motor. That is definitely something we'll want to keep an eye on to make sure that we're not crimping our wires where they shouldn't be crimped. And that will lead to premature wear and failure on copper wires. That is not something that you want. If you do have an any Cubic Cobra S1 or any of the more modern any Cubic Cobra printers that use connectors like this, go check the connector. Make sure it's okay. The last thing we want is for it to hurt something else in the machine. The machine threw an error. That's good. We want the machine to recognize something is wrong. This is kind of the deal of what you're looking for, right? But it shouldn't happen in the first place. So we have to really dig into why it happened and then determine how we can solve it. I think if we looked at a better rated connector and something that is rated for the vibrations this machine is going to see things might be a little bit easier however it's never perfect but if you do have an any cubic cobra s1 please do check it let us know down in those comments and if the people that are obviously yelling at their screen that that's not a jst connector i have no idea what i'm looking at what is it and is it rated for the type of power that they're going with because if it's not then that's an easy red flag that we can raise and look to see if it can be fixed by any cubic because we definitely don't want people to have machines that have underrated connectors for the type of wattage that they're pushing. And speaking of Grant getting something wrong, just last week, we showed you guys a Bamboo A1 Mini where the hot end had kind of fallen off and the screws were on the bed and they had a blob of doom that they said kind of messed with the hot end. And I thought that... The white thing hanging down from it was a broken wire. We can see there is a wire missing, which likely means your heater and your thermistor are shot and it is time to replace them. And we can see that the first person to mention it was Fatty Ben Moose. I don't know, man. There, your, your, your name's on screen saying that's a piece of filament, not a cable. The wires coming out of the bottom of the heater seem intact and... They're totally right. I blame white filament once again. I got fooled again by the white filament. White filament. Thinking it was actually wires, which is hilarious because at 3D Printopia, we actually saw a DeLorean that was mostly 3D printed at the Hatch X exhibit that used filament for the wires on the Mr. Fusion system. I, I should have known better. I should have known better. I should have known better. But this is what I love about having a community of people that are willing to fact check me, that are willing to tell me that I'm wrong. And look at that. I'm willing to tell you that I get it wrong from time to time. This is the most amazing part of this job is that you guys catch the things that I clearly didn't. I would have thought they would have <laughs> unloaded the filament. I didn't think there was going to be filament in there. My assumption was anything hanging from the hot end area or the extruder area must have been wires but no it was filament in fact since that's filament that hot end is probably perfectly fine all they gotta do is put everything back together and in theory it'll probably work just fine what was the one time in recent memory where you were wrong and you had someone pointed out to you and you just had this captain kirk facepalm moment wondering how the heck could i have missed that because honestly that is exactly what I had in this case. But not only do we love to show you when we're right, we also love to show you when we're wrong and when the community does a phenomenal job making that correction for me 
And hey, we like to give credit where it's due where we can. Moving on to the nozzle perfectly designed, kind of, for ironing. A zero millimeter nozzle. This is a nozzle that someone likely bought in a multi-pack off of Amazon where it clearly passed QC and is a 10 out of 10. No notes moving on to the next one. No, there's no, there's no drilling on this. Somehow this crappy nozzle got through QC with no drilling from either side. There, there looks like there was a bit of a peck drill here, but the counter bore was not done for the nozzle diameter, nor was the main bore to get down to the area where the counter bore and the main bore would reach each other. Don't know why, there's no easy way to fix this, just change out the nozzle. The person said, that's a new one, almost installed it. I, I, I think it's hilarious, and in theory, you could sand this down a little bit further till you get to the actual hex area of it, and turn it into an ironing-based extruder, so it's not pushing any film, and it's just using the hot nozzle to go across things, but then you would probably need something like a tool chain or be very, very, very good about changing nozzles. So chalk this one up to a learning experience. Don't buy cheap nozzles, or certainly if you're going to buy cheap nozzles, make sure you have a lot of them. Last but not least, the part of the intro that I'm sure at least 20% of you are still giggling at, the bumpy tops and beautiful bottoms from Blake770 over in the Polar Filament Discord. They got this part that objectively looks pretty darn good, except we got a little bit of the case of the pillows up here. And, uh, well, there's really only two basic things that this is pillowing or where you see bumps in your top surface is often when you don't have enough top layers. But when you only see it in some areas and not in all of them, it's likely because your printer failed to do the bridge on that top surface and it created a bit of a glob and then it just kept printing over that. Yes, more top layers would solve this problem. You would just cover up the shame. But when we asked Blake a little bit further about it, uh, come to find out they were using 5% grid infill. Lo and behold, there's your problem. What do you do? Well, first, I don't believe grid infill should ever be an infill that anybody uses. I think it's truly the worst infill out there, period. And if you want to use an infill that, like, you know, saves material and is reasonably fast. Adaptive Cubic has always been our go-to and something that we use in like 90 plus percent of the parts that we make for ourselves and for customers. It is a phenomenal infill. It doesn't take anywhere near as long as Gyroid does. And while it's not anastropic, which means it's not, you know, the same strength in every direction, neither are your 3D prints. So it's perfectly fine. But a little bit higher infill toward the top would work. You could use something maybe like support cubic or even lightning infill if you're really trying to reduce the amount of infill. Although you could also just add a layer height modifier. So the last, I don't know, five or six layers before it starts to do the top surface bridging would be at instead of 5%, maybe 10, 15, or even 20% to give the printer more ability to bridge. This is most common in machines that only have cooling on one side, and wherever this is, that is where the cooling is not actually reaching properly, or it's reaching too much. So if we look at the rest of the print, the rest of the print actually looks pretty good. I don't see anything else that I can reasonably complain about. I got a little bit of what might look like some Z-banding, although I think that's more temperature-based. So just watch out for your temps and make sure they're not fluctuating too badly yeah we we can see what looks like to be maybe some temperature fluctuation there but otherwise the part looks pretty good if this is more of a mechanical thing and not a pretty thing uh just sand it down and you'll be fine if it's a pretty thing just sand it down and you'll be fine yes it's the same answer for both no it doesn't matter it's not that big of a deal a little bit of sandpaper and a power sander and this is a 30 second problem what do you guys think I know pillowing is a very common one, especially when you drop your layer height down. And that's why in the slicers, you not only have the ability to set how many top and bottom layers that you have, but also the minimum wall thickness. So that if you say you have five top layers, but you change from 0.2 millimeter layers to 0.1 millimeter layers, if you still have your minimum thickness for your top layers being say one millimeter thick, it would go from instead of five it would go to 10 layers. And do remember, if you are gonna drop your layer height for a better looking part, 
you can keep your infill at your normal layer height. So you could go from a 0.2 layer height, but keep your infill still at 0.2. Or, 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 what are you, a seal? You can go down to 0.1 for your perimeters and 0.3 for your infill, which actually would make the part significantly stiffer, in my opinion, and generally will make your prints significantly faster, like dropping hours of time out of your prints. So if you need to combine both speed and quality, that is often the best way to do it. And since you are going to do thicker infill and thinner perimeters, do make sure that you have your top and bottom layers set correctly. But otherwise, this print looks pretty darn good. So I'm going to give this one 6 out of 10. What do you guys think? Let me know in those comments below. I do want to give a huge thank you to all the members whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Thank you for what you all do in making these videos possible. If you do want to support the efforts that we do here and uh, support us keeping manufacturers honest, helping people fix their machines, and, well, just general Florida man tomfoolery because, oh man, FiberSeek is going to let us do some tomfoolery. Uh, do join for as little as $1 a month to support that kind of stuff, and you'll get access to behind-the-scenes videos, and at the $10 tier and higher, you get to come and hang out in our private Discord server, where, if all goes well, we should have some Discord-only hangouts while we are out in Shanghai, which heavily excited for. I hope you guys are excited to see the craziness that comes out of it as well. That is all we have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your love, and don't forget to leave a like and get subscribed. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.